Every good video needs this. Let's start with a flashback. It was him and I working on it, and we both did a demo of our compositions. And in the end, his won. And it got an Emmy. So I went to him and I asked, what are you doing with your samples that makes them sound so good? Hello, friends. Have you ever wondered why some music sounds so good when it's sample based and other music sounds kind of blah? What are you going to do if you need to do an orchestral mock up or a final that has orchestral sounds? Last week, I was up at Vermont College of Fine Arts, which was my alma mater for my master's degree, and also I'd been there on staff for a number of years. And I hear a lot of music up there. Some of it is really great, but the samples are suffering. And then I hear other things where the samples are so amazing you can barely believe it. What is the difference? Okay, so tip one, I'm not sure how welcome this is, but you got to have good sample libraries. I just figured I'd get this one out of the way because everybody's like, oh no, I got to buy something. Well, you do have to have a certain level of quality. I went to him and I asked, what are you doing with your samples that makes them sound so good? He says to me, I never use long durations in strings. I was like, really? You know, because that's what you think of as a string doing a long duration. And of course, my magnum opus had that all over the place. And his is like, da 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 So I went back and listened, and it's like really true. All this music that we had done over the years, I don't think I heard a single long duration string thing in there. Part of this tip is really to write for the samples. Don't write what you know strings can do. Write for the sample. If your library does not do long tones, stay away from long tones. You have to take care not to do things that your samples can't do if you want people to be affected emotionally by what you're doing. Tip number three is to ask, what can the instrument do well? So, strings saw along very nicely. You can pluck a couple of notes. Trumpets, for example, do very nice repeated notes. French horn, not so much. It's a long course of study, but think about it. How can you find out more about each of those instruments? One thing that I'm going to recommend is a website called the Orchestra User's Manual. And I'll link that in the description below so that you can go have a look. That's a great website, and it has all sorts of real-world examples with people playing and you can watch them on video and discussing what they're playing. And also you can see it will have a staff with the range of an instrument. So if you think to yourself, what is this high B flat going to sound like with a trumpet player? You just click on the note and it has a couple, it has piano, it has forte. Uh, check them out and you can sort of see. The one thing I would caution you is, is keep in mind that these are really good players. Okay, so tip number four is to watch out for thin ice. So I know this story, and it is somewhat apocryphal, but it's interesting if true, and it's interesting if not true. So the Rite of Spring by Stravinsky starts with his really high bassoon part. And the bassoon player comes to him in one of the rehearsals and says, Mr. Stravinsky, I'm sorry, but this part is unplayable. And Stravinsky supposedly says, well, that's not my problem, it's yours. But in samples, that kind of thing is not going to work. You're on thin ice when you're doing that. Tip number five, a chain is only as good as its weakest link. So one thing that I heard at VCFA was a uh, film score. So we're looking at the film, and the oboe was playing a very plaintive kind of a sound and was really not so great, the sound. And it killed the whole thing for me. Tip number six, never lose sight of the fact that it's a sleight of hand. Use every trick in the book to make your sample sound good. Tip number seven is to respect the recording medium. So we've already talked about some pitfalls in terms of believability that occur in samples. But then there's also when you record real players. And sometimes real players don't come out sounding real depending on 
some ways you may have recorded them. If you take a string player and you close mic that string player, you may end up with something which doesn't sound real when the string player goes up high on the violin. Most string players are heard at a distance, and the air and the room have a lot to do with that. Another thing along the same lines is printing too hot and using samples which are not the right velocity for the music. Keep in mind that velocity and volume are two different things. Velocity on an instrument is about a lot more than just how loud something is. The loudness is the only thing that the player thinks about. Something is marked forte, something is marked piano. They'll approach it a different way, but they don't think about everything that goes into that. Yet, as composers, we have to, right? Well, look at this as an example. I live in New York City, so somebody goes by at night when we're lying in bed. They're screaming, and it's vitriol, and if they're half a mile away, I still get this blood pressure rise because I know I can hear in their voice what's going on. But then if my wife turns to me and whispers in my ear, that sound may be louder in terms of sound pressure level, SPL, but I can tell the difference in the timbre. The whisper has a throaty, quiet, gentle quality, and the person who's out on the street going nuts still makes my blood pressure go up, even though the volume is actually softer. And you have to watch this in terms of when you're working on your samples. I got a D50 in the 1980s as a Roland keyboard, and one of the things that I did was when I was going through the patches the first time, I found a pizzicato patch and played it, and I was like, oh my God, that sounds so full and rich. It doesn't mix into the texture because it's just so, so loud. That's one of my pet peeves. Pizzicato that's so loud doesn't really sound right to do every pitz loud. So things like this you have to watch out for. When you hit a timpani with a mallet, when you hit it soft and more in the middle, when it says piano or P, when it says forte, they're a little off the center and they hit it harder, the pitch, goes up a little bit because the head moved more. The head of the stick hits it in a way that makes a more of a high frequency that you hear in the attack. The sound is completely different. You can't do dynamics by adjusting volume. Dynamics have to come from velocity. Tip number eight is doubling. Samples basically show their worst qualities when they're solo. The uninspired sound of that oboe I mentioned before, you'll hear that very quickly if it's alone. But if you're getting that from a sample and you still want to keep the quality of the oboe, then double it up an octave with a string or in a lower octave with a clarinet, something like that to take the ear off of the shortcomings of that sample. Another thing is to limit the amount of time that that sample comes into your consciousness. So maybe take the first half of the line and make it oboe and the second half and make it clarinet. That will get you away from that oboe sound quick enough that it makes the suggestion without forcing us to focus on the limitations of the sound too much. To expand on this a little bit, I want to talk about three ways in which you can fix up the samples that are not serving you so well. One of those, which we just discussed, is orchestrationally. So people have been doing this for hundreds of years. You can split lines into various octaves, various instrumental choirs. You can double the downbeats of things with one instrumental choir, say the strings while the winds are playing the whole passage. And those things can add excitement, and they can also take away from the shortcomings of samples that you're using. The second is strategies, which I would call it the level of the library. So. A lot of times what I will do is I will take a core string sound and then I will double it with a completely different library. And that library 
will be maybe 20% in the mix. The core sound is 80%. The other library is 20%. Maybe I'll put a reverb on the other library. That is something you can do with two different libraries. The third thing I'm going to talk about is what I call the hybrid strategy. Now, with the hybrid strategy, it involves using some real instrumentalists with your sampled orchestra to get even more realism. Much of the time, an orchestra, in its conventional sense, the core sound is the strings, and the icing is the woodwinds and the brass, and the percussion basically punctuates certain parts. You don't really get an incessant percussion part from the beginning to the end like you do in other kinds of music, rock and jazz, for example. I look towards the strings as a way to get believability. Also, strings tend to have more articulations than other instruments, and so they're very hard to replicate in samples. So what I will often do is I will hire four players, two violin players, a viola player, and a cello player. Unless there's a really special bass part, I leave the bass out. What I'm doing is I'm taking the exact parts that the orchestra is playing in the sampled parts, and I have the music written out for the players, and I have them come and double the music while listening to the recording. And then I mix those parts in with the recording so that we get more realism. And I hire them separately. We do this all as overdubs. Let's say we get two violinists, one violist, and one cellist. And I'm going to give these people names. Let's say the violinists are Jenny and Sam, and the violist is Carla, and the cellist is David. Okay, so we've got four people that are coming in at different times, and the music is all written out. The string part of an orchestra is generally first violin, second violins, violas, cellos, and basses. And let's take the easiest use case scenario, which is each line, the first violins, the second violins, the violas, etc., has a single line, a single note. There's something to watch out for in arranging, which is if you have two instruments, and this is especially true of strings because strings don't have frets that are doubling each other in the same octaves, you either need those string players to be incredibly good or you've got to expect some rubs in terms of intonation. So what I will do is I will use three overdubs per musician per part. So what that looks like is this. We get Jenny in. Jenny overdubs the first violins three times. Then we get Sam in. Sam does that same thing three times. Then we move to the second violins. Second violins, I'm going to do two and two on. So we're going to end up with four doublings to the one part. So Jenny will do two passes on violin two. Sam will do two passes on violin two. Then the viola player, Carla, comes in. She's going to do three passes on viola. Then David, the cellist, comes in. He's going to do three passes on cello. The basses are basically going to be carried by the samples. What that means is that I have six times through violin one, I have four times through violin two, and then I have three on the violas and three on the cellos. Well, there's two things that this does. One is it avoids intonation problems because you always have three people playing at once on every single part so that there's not that rub that might happen. First, I'll give you a caveat about this. Watch out for phasing. Very often you can get an unflattering form of phasing if you have the same player, same instrument, same mic, same room configuration, playing the same part. And I've found that the sweet spot is about three passes. If you do more than three passes, you're going to start to hear phasing in a way which is unflattering. Three overdubs per person. That's as far as you want to go with that. But two is too few, except in the case of the second violins, because you really have four parts, and together they will give that chorusing effect 
even though you're taking two from each individual. Also, this mirrors the general makeup of an orchestra. First violins, it may be 20 of them. Second violins, it'll be 11, let's say. Violas are eight. Maybe there's six cellos and three basses, something like that. So the lower you go down in pitch, the less individuals there are playing. And this overdubbing strategy does that. Now, the next question is what happens when you encounter divisi? Now, divisi is when a part splits. So there's more than one note on one of those lines. Let's say the violin split. This is different than a double stop, which is two notes, but everybody plays the same two notes. So when it's divided naturally in an orchestral texture, there would be less players on the top and less players on the bottom. Let's take, for example, that 20 number that I threw out for first violin. So that means that 10 would be playing top note, 10 would be playing the bottom note, and you need to make allowances for that in some way or another. Now, it's, at the library level, some, some libraries will let you do that. For instance, LAS has a way that it combines sections so that when you go into a divisi, it'll sound more realistic. Other libraries don't, so you have to handle that somehow. But also, this technique or the hybrid thing, if you do divisi and you increase it just a little bit. So let's say divisi on the top line might be eight, where Jenny does two of the top note and two of the bottom note, and then Sam does two of the top note and two of the bottom note. So it actually becomes more instruments for a second, but it's not that much more. And on violin two, Jenny would do three, and Sam would do three. That would give you enough to play with. And then you can listen to the sound of it and decide what you want. So that expands it to eight overdubs on the first, and then six overdubs on the second. And then I would expand the bottom two to four and four. Because they're not in exactly the same tessitura, because obviously one note is going to be higher and the other is going to be lower, that will still work out. And if you have things where the notes double for any specific amount of time, like it's divisi and then you have five notes where they play the same note and then it goes back to divisi, I would go back to the previous one. But as always in these things, you want to collect as much as possible and use the best stuff and let your ear be your guide. Another thing to keep in mind is your players don't have to be perfect. They can have little intonation problems. It's going to add to the realism of it. So don't worry too much if you don't have the very best players, unless the music is really hard. Now we get to the topic of orchestral panning. Panning, of course, means looking at the stereo spread from left to right and deciding where you're going to place the elements in the stereo spread. Now, there are a couple of standard pannings for orchestra, one of which I'll show you on the screen right now in kind of a cutesy diagram. I used to have this diagram right next to me when I mixed for a long time until I kind of got it embedded in my head. And in this diagram, which is a standard orchestral orientation, the violins are on the left, the lower stuff, cellos and basses, are on the right, and violas are kind of in the middle. And so this is a little different than the way people pan stuff in rock music, right? That's the standard way. Then there's some Hollywood orchestra stuff where the first violins are here, second violins are here, and the stuff that has bass content is a little more in the middle. And that is more like a rock record. In rock records, they wanted to make sure that the needle didn't skip out of the LP, and they were making things louder and louder, so they tended to put the bass frequencies right in the middle. But with orchestral panning, it's most often still that conventional way. And most libraries I've worked with, that's how they operate. What you're going to do is you're going to take your overdubs, the real live players, and you're going to put them exactly where your sections are sitting. So your six first violins are going to go over here, mostly to the left. Your four second violins are going to go here, left but a little less so. Your three violas are going to go here. 
and then your three cellos are gonna go there. So I'm just gonna show you on paper here how I would pan these strings. This is your sampled orchestra right here. We have, remember, three of Jenny and three of Sam in the first violin. So here's what I'd probably do. I'd do Jenny, Sam, Jenny, Sam, Jenny, Sam. And with these three in the back, I would make them a little softer and I would put them a little more in a reverb than these three so that I actually created a sense of space. And this is panning to the left, audience left. Now, a little further in, I would have the four that we recorded for the second violins. And I think I would just alternate these. So Jenny and Sam, Sam and Jenny. And same thing, these would be a little bit further back in the mix and a little more reverb. Here are the violas. These are the second violins, of course. These were the first violins. Here are the violas. We have three, three Carlas, and maybe we would go like this, but one in the front and two a little more in, in the back a bit, or maybe we do it the other way around, however it sounds good. And this is David. These are the cellos. Violas, of course, cellos. So with David, same thing, one way or the other. Sometimes it helps to put an individual out front just a teeny bit more. David. David. And there we go. That's how we'll do it. If you have less of a budget, you can hire less musicians. I've actually had great results just hiring a single violinist. And with that violinist, having them play all the parts that I can get them to play. In other words, all the violin parts and any viola stuff that they can do and any cello stuff that's high enough that they can do it. I recommend two things. One is that you write out their parts in treble clef in the correct octave. You don't want to make them read clefs they're not used to reading. And the second thing is don't double things at the octave. If you do that doubling at the octave just so that the whole line gets played, you're going to end up with something that sounds like a big organ instead of discrete parts. But sometimes you can mix them in a little bit. Um, you have a violinist do a cello part that's kind of at the top of the range of the cello. By the way, cellos go quite high. They'll go to a G, a 15th above middle C. And that is quite high. So there's a lot of things in the cello range that are actually going to fit on the violin. Just put them in, tuck them in at the top, and they'll give a little bit of extra realism. Again, all this is about sleight of hand, right? So you're not necessarily, you wouldn't write this in a score. This is something that you're just doing in the recording studio. Okay, so the next thing to talk about is articulation switching, right? Take strings again. You have pizzicato. You have staccato, you have spiccato, you have legato, consort, meaning with mute, collegno, you have flautando. There's a bunch of different articulations that you can use on strings, and that's one reason they're so great, is because they have all of these possibilities. My philosophy is that instruments basically have gotten all of their cues from language. So the rhythm of language, the rhythm of breathing, of taste, all these things are present in instrumental lines the same way they are in our speech. How do you write a great paragraph? The first thing is to vary the length of sentences, some of which can go on long and some of which go on for a shorter amount of time, like this one or this. That's how you make language interesting, is with variability. You need to do the same thing when you're writing for instruments. One thing to remember is that a melody is best when it has a mixture of predictability and surprise. Also, instrumental lines are best executed when they have a sense of breathing. I did an orchestration job one time for the Discovery Channel, and the show was called Life. So I got people's cues, and these days people can just mock up cues 
and they don't really have to worry about how a player plays. So I got a cue that had an ostinato and an alto flute that went on for four and a half minutes without a place for a break. Okay, well, you know, if that was a synth sound or whatever, fine, but I was gonna hand these to live players. So what did I have to do? Well, I had to split it up between different instruments and choirs to make it work. A good orchestrator and a good composer would know not to do that in the first place. Because even if it can be done, it's not going to sound right to people. You're going to be back to that thing where people are going to say, you know, something's just off, or it's cheesy, or why, why does, I don't like this music. They don't know. Also keep in mind that instrumental lines in all large ensembles like this are to an extent going to have to do with melody. The harmonies are resultant. There are occasions where you have some sort of effect, whatever it might be, and your music may be all in effect, in which case disregard what I'm saying. But if you're writing music where the lines are all supposed to be melodic, occasionally there's a gliss or a rip or something happens, but mostly the melodies, you have to respect that. You have to respect the way melodies are. Listen to vocals. Listen to how vocalists sing. They have to breathe. Their melodies are simple. They go up a few steps, then they go down by a reasonable leap. And it requires an economy of scale that you do well to understand a little bit and apply to your instrumental things as well. Tip 10, continuous controllers. Now, if you write with samples and you don't use continuous controllers, you're missing a lot because that's where the expression comes in. Now, the most common continuous controllers that I know of are controller number one, which is assigned to modulation most often, controller number seven, which is assigned to volume most often, and controller number 11, which is assigned to expression. In a lot of libraries, these controllers will be used differently, and sometimes they're even used differently in the same library. For instance, LAS has the same controller will do different things depending on whether it's a short or a long. So the controller will do one thing on a spiccato, pizzicato, staccato, and a different thing on a long, sustained tone. Sometimes controller one will be vibrato, and controller 11 will be expression. Expression in strings would be maybe where you dig in a little bit with the bow. Using volume to try and affect dynamics is a last case resort because it doesn't sound right. Remember the story of the whispering versus the screaming. Sound pressure level is one thing and expression is another. Now, you all know that samples use what's called velocity layers to do crescendos and decrescendos. So what that is is that you may have one, two, three, four, or more layers played at a different volume with your samples. So they sample E, and that's at piano. Then they sample the same E, and it's at mezzo piano. Then they sample it again at mezzo forte, and they sample it again at forte. And the way you get it to actually crescendo is by using some controller, most often modulation or maybe expression, and that will change between layers so that they become more and more expressive or strident, or not just louder, but the, the timbre will change. Also keep in mind that each sample library is going to use continuous controllers differently somehow. So it's up to you to actually do some serious research and figure out what continuous controllers your libraries are using. So tip number 11 is about timing. Now, I work in a DAW all day long. I've seen the grid. I understand there's this tendency, right? I want to be perfect. Like I see that I played something a little late. I want to make it perfect. So I shove it back to the beginning and I shove this one over a little bit to the third beat and I do it. And then I'm like, hey, you know, here's a great idea. I'll just quantize it all. We'll do a hard quantize, right? Now that's a machine. That's not how players play. And 
your samples are going to sound much less convincing if everything is right on the beat. So don't worry about that so much. Worry about what your ears hear. Another thing that I do is I try to envision myself as every player. And I do that using my knowledge of the idiomatic aspects of the various instruments and also my knowledge of what the music might elicit in me. Now, when I was in college, I wrote a piece of orchestral music and I did a short score and the professors were all very excited and then when I orchestrated it, they were like, oh my God. So this really great mentor of mine arranged for me to be in the orchestra and I would you know, hit the bass drum every once in a while and they gave me all the easy stuff. The guys in the orchestra were so nice to me, it was really great. But one of the things that I learned is that, you know, your state of mind is, is really part of it. The first thing we did was The Planets by Gustav Holst. And so we're doing Mars, and it moves up to this huge crescendo. It's like you're in it for two minutes, and I was the bass drum player. Whack! Like right at the top of that. Man, I was so exciting. So how did I feel when that was going on, right? That's how you want your sampled drum player to feel. I mean, it's, a, it's not a real person, but are they so excited that they hit it a little earlier? Are they later because they feel like a badass? You know, whatever it is, think about all these things, like from a humanistic point of view. How do you want them to be? And use the grid to be in the wrong place. Build in the imperfections. Okay, my final tip, number 12, is about space. So I've come over the past years to love what's called a convolution reverb. And a convolution reverb is a verb where they go into a space. And in the old days, they used to use a starter pistol, which they would shoot off. More often than not, they use some sort of sweep of frequencies like a sine wave or pink noise or white noise or something. And they actually sample the space. And that is amazing because what you can do with that is you can design a lot of different things around that. For instance, you can put your player at a certain place in the space and have them play from that place. So all these pannings that we saw in the little cute drawing, you can put your players right there with your reverb. And you can have them playing in the Sydney Opera House. So look for a good convolution reverb that you can use to put your players in a space that can be very convincing. So this is the end of my rant. What do you want to rant about? Put it in the comments below. Do you have some tips? Anything that seemed weird about what I was saying? Something I can clarify? Also, let me know any other topics that you'd like me to discuss. And finally, have a great week. If you want to subscribe, not going to hate it. If you want to hit the like button, it's not the worst thing you could do. Other than that, Go about your day, have a great time, and I'll see you next week.